Hey, this is Tim from Wrong Sports, and welcome back to another episode of Discontinued. This is where I cover the history, great coaches, players, and moments from a college football program that is no longer around or a college football program that has been greatly de-emphasized. And today's school that I'll be covering is a school that has college football currently, but their program has been de-emphasized so much that it went from being a top football program before World War II to being a program that plays in Division Three right now, and they really aren't talked about much. The school that I'll be covering this week is the University of Chicago and the Chicago Maroons football program. They had one of the most famous early college football coaches. They were an early rival of Michigan. Plus, they have a national championship or two, and the school that had the first Heisman winner as well. So with all that history, why did the University of Chicago get rid of their college football program for years? Well, it was a few factors, but like most programs that have ended, it was really just one guy at the top that ended it. I'll tell you more about that in just a moment, but before I move on, make sure you like this video, make sure you share this video, and of course, make sure you subscribe to the channel, please. Make sure you ring the bell as well, because that'll give you a heads up on when I'm dropping a brand new video. And as always, make sure you follow me on Twitter at SportsWronged. So to get started with the Chicago Maroons football, you have to start with one man, and that is Amos Alonzo Stagg. Stagg was born and raised in West Orange, New Jersey in 1862, less than 20 miles from New York City. Stagg was raised in a poor neighborhood and his father worked odd jobs, so he didn't really see him much after he came back from the Civil War. But when young Amos Alonzo Stagg, who was named Lonnie, would see his father, he would often work with him and one of these jobs was mowing the lawn, which allowed him to gain great strength and conditioning, which would work well for him later on. He would also gain extra money as well for him and his family. And speaking of that, Stagg would graduate high school in less than three years and go to Yale at the age of 22 in 1885. When Stagg first got on campus, he didn't play football as his first love was baseball. And he was a pitcher and he was a pretty darn good one as well as he had a game where he struck out 20 batters. And he was also offered a $4,000 baseball scholarship in late 1888. He didn't take that contract though as he was a divinity student at Yale and he was looking towards a career there. But after a conversation that in hindsight was very good for football, Stagg talked to future Nobel Prize winner John R. Mott, who was big in evangelical circles. And after talking to him, Mott would tell Stagg that he wasn't great speaking on his feet. After hearing that, Stagg dropped going into being a minister and didn't do any speaking engagements for decades because of that comment. So now that he wasn't focused on being a divinity student, he would move into playing football and he would start playing mostly in 1888 and 1889 for the legendary father of American college football, Walter Camp. Camp coached Stagg and the other players on Yale to a 13-0 record in 1888 and only one loss in 1889. Stagg would be one of Camp's favorite players, and he would learn a lot from Camp, as you would learn about as we continue. After graduation, Stagg would get a job on staff at Springfield College, which was actually a YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1890, and he would work as their first football coach. He would have a 10, 11, and 1 record. During these two years, though, he would come up with two new inventions, like the ends back formation, or having running backs behind the quarterback to run to the left or the right of the lines, instead of running down the middle, which was what was common in early college football. Plus, he would also come up with a reverse play from the ends back formation. And finally, during his time at Springfield, he also came up with the 7, 2, and 2 defense, which he would use throughout his time at his next school. And speaking of his next school, Stagg would move on to Chicago, and he would do that after a professor at Yale, William Rainey Harper, became the president at Chicago and picked Stagg to be the first ever football coach, as well as head of athletics, and the job was a lifetime position. The reason for that was because Stagg was a great negotiator, but he really didn't know it. The story goes that when President Harper called to talk to him about the position, Stagg didn't give him an answer immediately because he was shocked at how much money and the high position that was offered to him. The president thought that he was not taking the offer seriously and upped it, and then upped it to more until Stagg finally talked because he could no longer deny it and took the job. So in 1892, Stagg would pack his bags and come to Chicago with his vast knowledge of the game, as well as his many innovations to get started with his college football program that he would have to start in the fall of 1892. 
Now you should know that the University of Chicago only opened two years previous to this, so it was quite small. It had a lot of new buildings and there were still many buildings that were being built. And also there were no athletic teams or facilities whatsoever. So Stagg would be building this entire athletic department by himself. Another thing he knew was that the only way this program was going to get big was that it was going to need a place to play. So he would start breaking ground on Marshall Field towards the end of 1892 for the 1893 season so that his team would actually have a place to play. And he would have to pay for this out of his own pocket. For the 1892 season though, this team would be playing at Washington Park, which is a larger park right across the street from the university. They would play at least seven games here, with the first six being basically scrimmage games versus high school and YMCAs, which they would win, but they weren't blowouts. And the team wasn't very good either, and Stagg knew that. That when he had only 15 players show up for his first tryout and practice, he knew that he was going to have to suit up one more time. And he would suit up for every game and do something, not a lot, in every game in 1892. Even though he was playing, it didn't help as his Chicago team had to play universities and that didn't go so well. They started with a tie versus Northwestern at the Southside Ballpark, which was where the White Sox would play years later. But they would end up making $22 from game receipts, and Stagg in his thrifty ways knew that whatever money he could make, he would use for this program and he could make the best of it. They would end up only beating Illinois and picking up their first intercollegiate win over Lake Forest College before that. Next season, Stagg was making Chicago into a Western power, since not many teams were over the Mississippi River at that time. They got their stadium Marshall Field this season and would play 10 out of their 12 games there. The new field, as well as getting some new students, resulted in them going 6-4-2 in 1893. But even though he wouldn't be a player coach this season, he would play one final time as he would take the field as a quarterback versus Purdue because his first two quarterbacks got injured and there was no one else to suit up at that time. His play didn't result in a win over Purdue, but the game was famous because it was so rough that the attorney general of the county in Indiana almost put a stop to the game because of how many injuries and how rough it was. Stagg, now no longer a player and now focusing solely on being a coach, put a major uptick in the schedule for his football team in the next season as they played 22 games in 1894. The reason for the amount of games was because Stagg was a beast and he wanted his team to also be a beast so he did schedule a lot of high school games and some YMCA games. Along with that, they also played Michigan, Purdue, Wisconsin, and Iowa, but they only tied Iowa and lost to everyone else I just mentioned. So along with all those extra games, Stagg would also add four extra games at the end of the season. The reason for this was because of his friendship with his former coach, Walter Camp, who is now the coach at Stanford, and he talked Stagg into bringing his team out west for four games. These were essentially the first bowl games or postseason games as Chicago would beat Stanford in San Francisco 24-4 on Christmas Day in 1894. They would play Stanford again four days later, before rounding out this year with two games versus Western Athletic Clubs. They went 2-2 two and two on this trip. They finished their year 14-7-1, but their trip out west was huge because it would usher in the Rose Bowl that would come just about a decade later. But going into the next season, going out west really helped the Chicago Maroons football program and football gain a lot of respect and credibility in the 1890s. Stagg would help even more as in 1895, Chicago went 10-3. They beat Wisconsin and Northwestern once, but they were still losing to Michigan. These familiar matchups and rivalries would come to a head next year with the formation of the Western Conference. This was a precursor to the Big Ten. It only had seven teams at this time, with Chicago along with Illinois, Minnesota, Purdue, Northwestern, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Chicago would start the 1896 season going 12-0, beating mostly high school and smaller colleges, but they did shut out Notre Dame. This was before Notre Dame became what they became. They would give up points in their 13th game in a loss to Northwestern, and they would also lose to Wisconsin. Chicago ended their season, though, on a high note, as they ruined Michigan's undefeated season, beating them 7-6. Chicago was the only team in 1896 to play conference games, though they did play two games versus Northwestern. 
Another thing that would come out of 1896 was that Stag would start to use a huddle before the play to go over the game plan and also to try and psych out the other team. They would also start using the short punt formation, which at the time was revolutionary because the forward pass wasn't used too much and punting was the best way to move the ball long distances as you relied on your defense for turnovers or a bad punt for better field position. It was also revolutionary because the ball carrier wasn't snapping the ball right from the line and instead was a a few yards back, like the shotgun formations of today. Moving on to 1897, they were one win away from a conference title as again they started 10-0, including beating Illinois, Northwestern, and Michigan, but they fell to Wisconsin at home, ending the season 11-1. The team was again gaining momentum with another double-digit win season and another football invention in the line shift. The team would get bigger and better in 1898 as they started to use the lateral and this resulted in them having a better rushing attack, and they showed it with a 12-0-1 record to start, but mostly again beating smaller colleges and high school. They would play another intersectional game versus Pennsylvania. Penn were coming in this game on a 30-game winning streak, and last year's national champion. Plus this year, they weren't scored upon either. Chicago would travel all the way to Philly to play Penn, and also it was a matchup between two former Yale players, as both Stagg and Penn head coach George Woodruff played together for four years on Yale. Chicago wouldn't get shut out like the other teams that played Penn this year, but they couldn't win, and they suffered their first loss, 23-11. Their season ended with a one-point loss to Michigan, but the team was getting more popular as they were drawing 12,000 for that season-ending rivalry game. The next season, though, would bring their best team yet, as Chicago went unbeaten in 1899 and undefeated in the Western Conference, beating Wisconsin to win their first conference title. They played two elite Eastern teams like Cornell and beat them, but in the rematch versus Penn, they tied them, ruining their undefeated season. But they still went unbeaten, so you could say they were the best team in the country at this point. So even though they ended that last century with a conference title, the start of this new century didn't bring them any titles, as they only won two conference games in 1900, including their final win over Michigan for quite a while, and they would go winless in 1901. In 1902, however, they were undefeated in the Western Conference and unscored upon until they ran into Michigan and Michigan's new coach, Fielding H. Yost. Michigan would shut out Chicago and give them their only loss of 1902, which again was something common for the next couple of years. But moving on to a big game that would happen in 1903, as Chicago would travel to New York to play Army. And yeah, this was a big game, because Army was a top team, and they were a top team in the East that would only play other top teams in the East. And when they did start to play other teams that were not Eastern teams, it was a big deal. So win or loss, this would really make the Chicago Maroons football team even bigger. Well, it didn't result in a win for Chicago as they would lose to Army, giving them their first loss of the season. In 1904, Chicago was a top team in the West since there wasn't a Midwest yet and everything east of Pennsylvania was basically the West. Chicago started the 1904 season shutting out four straight conference teams before sputtering in a tie versus Illinois. Chicago played an interesting team in Game 10 when University of Texas came to Marshall Field. Texas was venturing out of the South for the first time and Chicago would crush them 68 to nothing. Chicago was 9-0-1 when they traveled to Ann Arbor to play Yost and Michigan. And Michigan hadn't lost in over three years, and it would continue again as Michigan outlasted Chicago 22-12. But this was one of their closest games yet, and Chicago followed up with a win over Wisconsin to end their season with one loss in the conference again due to Michigan. So if you have watched any of my other videos or any of my ranking videos, and if you haven't, I will put a link above to my best oldest teams. You will see that I talk about the 1905 Chicago team. So that kind of ruins what happens here, and I'll make it quick. As Stagg knew he was gonna have a great team here, as he called it his finest team since his time at Chicago. And he was certainly right, as this Chicago team in 1905 shut out every opponent except for Indiana, who they still beat beat by 11. In their final game, it was at Marshall Field in front of 27,000 fans to see Chicago play Michigan, 
Now, Michigan was undefeated for five years, and Chicago still hadn't beaten them for five years, but they were unbeaten this year, and Chicago shut out Michigan. For the first time in five years, it gave Stag his first undefeated season as well. Chicago was 11-0. They beat seven Western Conference teams, and this team also had two future College Football Hall of Famers on it. And Hugh Bezdick, who made Penn State into an Eastern power, and he took them to a Rose Bowl in the next decade. And a reserve quarterback on the 1905 team, his name was Jesse Harper. He wouldn't play that much, but he would gain a lot of fame as the coach that made Notre Dame and also coached Newt Rockney. But a big reason for this 1905 team being undefeated and being national champions was that Stagg created the Notre Dame box formation, as it was called. It preceded the single wing formation that was used through the 1960s, and it would allow for Chicago to have some of their best offenses in the next decade or two. And just as Chicago was reaching their heights, college football was also starting to get bigger and starting to spread all around the country, except it would also start to change a lot because there were several player deaths in 1905. So college football would have to make a lot of changes, and even President Roosevelt would jump in as well to try to help football with these rule changes. One big rule change that would affect Chicago in the next coming decades was you would no longer be able to schedule more than 12 games. So Chicago would no longer be able to schedule games versus high schools or YMCAs. And also this would allow Chicago to basically play conference games for the next three decades. Another big change that would come out of these rule changes was the forward pass. This would open up the game more and also allow for less injuries as it was less trench warfare and more finesse through the air. Stagg wouldn't take the responsibility for the forward pass or its conception as he said that he and other players were making plays involving a pass but never used them when he was still playing at Yale. Chicago would use passing plays but I couldn't really find stats on early seasons so they wouldn't get credit like St. Louis and Eddie Kokums would in the 1906 season. Chicago went through five game seasons in 1906 and 1907, finishing 4-1 and one in both of those seasons. They would lose to Minnesota in 1906, and they lost to Carlisle in 1907. But they did get their second unbeaten season in 1908, with a record of 5-0 and in the Western Conference, and only tying Cornell at home in mid-November. So Chicago was very consistent during the first decade, and it was looking that way through the early 1910s, except for a trying two-win season in 1910. They did have back-to-back six-in-one seasons in 1911 and 1912, only losing to Western Conference teams like Minnesota and Wisconsin, respectively. These almost title years built up for another great run in 1913, as the team would go undefeated at 7-0, they would only play Western Conference opponents. They had three shutouts, and they only gave up four touchdowns during the season. But they didn't wow people with their offense, as it was a lot of running, so this team only averaged 16 points per game in those seven wins. They won a share of the national title in 1913, but this team doesn't get as much credit as the 1905 team would. Also in 1913, Chicago would become one of the first schools to start putting jersey numbers on players. So after that 1913 title season, they would finish with winning records in 1914 and 1915, before a 3-4 record in 1916. And as the world was changing with World War I starting across the ocean, the Western Conference was changing too, with the addition of Ohio State in 1916, and then the re-entry of Michigan to give them 10 teams and to become the Big Ten Conference. Chicago went 2-2-1 two, two, in the Big Ten in 1917, but the new teams and also the war was taking some students off campus, so Chicago went 0-5 oh, in the conference in 1918. This was the first time they went winless in the conference. They did, however, go 0-4-1 in 1901, but they did have that tie, so it did give them something. After the war, though, Chicago got some really good talent back, and Stagg would start to build another great team. The 1919 team would go 4-2 in the conference, as they would only give up 26 points this season. But to start the 1920s, they had a very weird 1920 season. And uh, yeah, let me tell you about it, because they started with three straight shutouts. 
before they had a one point loss to Ohio State. That loss brought them three straight losses to end the season. And in those three straight losses, they got shut out. But that weird season might have given Chicago and also Stag, now 60 years old, a kick in the butt as the team and himself would start to hit their stride. They started the 1921 season undefeated and unscored on. Then they played their biggest game since traveling west to play Stanford, as they would now travel to New Jersey to play Princeton. Princeton were the defending national champions and had their on-again, off-again coach, Bill Roper. This game was scheduled because Bill Roper was a big fan of Stag, and he also used the short punt formation that was created by Stag, and he always liked him, and he figured this was going to be a big game for both teams. This game was hard fought, and Chicago would get their third shutout as they scored a 9-0 win. It was a huge win for Chicago, and they followed it up with inviting the University of Colorado, who were traveling out of the Rocky Mountains for the first time, to play Chicago. Chicago kept their shutout streak going, winning 35 to nothing, but then the next week they were back to the Big Ten teams, as they would play Ohio State. Ohio State were unbeaten in the conference, and they kept it that way, as they gave Chicago their first loss in a 7 to nothing shutout loss. Chicago would still have a chance at the conference title as they beat Illinois and they handed Wisconsin their only conference loss to end Chicago's season 6-1 and one, and they were 4-1 and one in the conference. Iowa ended up going undefeated so they won the conference that year in a hard-fought 1921 season. But now 1922 was here and Stagg was now 60 years old and he was looking towards grooming the next coach so he chose one of his best from the last season. His name was Fritz Chrysler. Chrysler would be a top assistant for the next eight years, and he would be in line to be the next coach and also athletic director whenever Stagg would step down. They started playing three games at home, beating Southern Schools Georgia 20 to nothing, then beating Northwestern by eight, and getting another shutout over Purdue. They were now 3-0 and and playing a rematch of their biggest game from out of conference last season as they would play Princeton. Princeton this time would be coming to Stag Field, and this game was significant because it was the first game that Princeton would travel outside of the Eastern Time Zone. And bigger, this game was broadcast on radio all over the country. So this game had a huge crowd of over 31,000 people, and the game was a good one too, as Chicago would get in the end zone three times behind their star player, John Webster Thomas. But Princeton would do the same. The only thing that broke the tie were the extra points, as Princeton made all three of their extra points, and Chicago would miss all three of theirs, so Princeton would win 21-18. So with their season ruined, they would get back next week at a team that ruined their season last year as they would play Ohio State, and they would beat them in Ohio Stadium. Chicago would follow that up by shutting out Illinois, and then have a season finale tie versus Wisconsin. Even though Chicago had a 4-0-1 record, Iowa and Michigan were undefeated in the conference, so they shared the title, and Chicago missed out once again. 1923 would be the same, as they would miss out on a conference title, but it was because of one player, and it would be one of the earliest great players of the gridiron, Red Grange. Chicago started this season, though, with three straight shutouts and were 4-0 as they traveled to Champaign, Illinois to play the Illini. Red Grange was running all over teams as a sophomore, and Chicago kept him in check for most of the game, but they couldn't score, and Illinois outlasted them 7 to nothing. With their conference hopes now gone, they finished the season with dominating wins over Indiana, Ohio State, and Wisconsin to finish up 7-1, but Illinois would win the conference that year behind Red Grange. Even though they missed out on the title in 1924, they got a chance again, but it started with a shocking loss this time to Missouri. But even though they started the season with an out-of-conference loss, they wouldn't lose again in their Big Ten games, except they wouldn't also win them all. They would win three games and tie three games to have a very weird 3-0-3 record in the Big Ten. They did win the conference title this year, but that was because there were no other unbeaten teams. Another reason why Chicago won the conference with this very weird record was because they managed to slow down Red Grange when they played them this season. 
Redgrange hadn't been defeated his sophomore year, and they were 5-0 coming into this game in 1924. Stagg put his top assistant Fritz Chrysler on how to stop Grange, and they kinda did that, but he still managed to score three times versus Chicago. Fortunately though, Chicago would do the same, so they tied the game 21-21. Grange and Illinois would lose the next week, and with Chicago not losing again, they would win the conference title. Now at 62, Stagg and that 1924 team would be the best team he would have for the rest of his time at Chicago, as the rest of the 1920s weren't great for his teams, as they had two winless Big Ten campaigns in 1926 and 1928, and to round out the decade in 1929, they would play Princeton one more time and beat them, but they would unfortunately suffer a 1-3 record in the Big Ten. There would also be another big change that would happen in 1929, and it would happen on the campus of Chicago, as they would get a new president, and he would be there for quite a while, and he would do a lot of changing while he was on campus. His name was Robert Maynard Hutchins. Hutchins would have to navigate the beginning of the Great Depression when he started in 1929, so we really didn't worry about the football team just yet, but remember him because his name is going to come up a lot as we get to the end of this story. Now when the 1930s came, Stagg was still full of energy as he would still jog a mile every day, and a note, he would do this until he was in his 80s because he's a beast. But even though he was still ready to coach his team, his team wasn't the same as it was a decade ago. To start in the 1930s, Stagg would lose his top assistant, Chrysler, to Minnesota, as well as go winless in the Big Ten and only score seven points in those Big Ten games. The scoring would get a little better, but they were still only scoring 71 points over 11 games in 1931, and they were going 3-7-1. 1932 would bring Stagg's 42nd year at Chicago, and also his 70th birthday. The team would score 95 points for this 42nd year, over eight games this season, but it still resulted in another three-win season and one win in the Big Ten. Now, after this season in the spring, Stagg and Chicago President Robert Hutchins would meet due to Stagg reaching 70 or retirement age. Hutchins and Stagg would meet eight times during the spring, trying to discuss what would be the next step for Stagg. With Hutchins offering him several advisory positions at the school at his same salary of $8,000, which was an incredible amount of money in the 1930s. But unfortunately, none of these advisory positions were for football coach or athletic director, though I don't really know if athletic director was given to Stagg, but it didn't really matter because Stagg wanted to be the football coach and since he wasn't offered it, he declined them all and he would leave the university. Most thought after this that Amos Alonzo Stagg would retire since he was 70 years old, but like I mentioned, he was an absolute beast, and he would go out west to coach at the College of Pacific from 1933 to 1946, and finally going into semi-retirement, but he was still an associate coach through the rest of his 80s and 90s alongside his son, and Stagg would finally die in 1965 at the ripe age of 102. He went 244, 111 and 27 at Chicago, and he had seven Big Ten titles. So with Stagg gone, Chicago would have to continue with a whole new person running things, as Stagg pretty much ran everything while he was at the university. So Chicago would go out and hire Iowa State's athletic director, T. Nelson Metcalf, to be the new athletic director. Metcalf would go out and hire, as his first hire, Loyola College coach Clark Shaughnessy. Shaughnessy was only available because his contract at Loyola ran out, as he was under a contract by a New Orleans millionaire who signed Shaughnessy to coach Loyola for $175,000 a year. Shaughnessy was making about $2.5 million a year in 2020 dollars. Now I'm not sure why he took the Chicago job, because the team wasn't very good and it was hard to succeed a legend like Stagg at Chicago, but Chicago was offering Shaughnessy a comfortable $7,000 $500 a year contract, and it had a lifetime contract to go along with that too. So Shaughnessy would be taking a huge pay cut, and there would also be a lot of handicaps with the job. 
Now, Shaughnessy would have to deal with a new Chicago education strategy as well, which changed examinations around, which affected their scheduling as well as their practice in the spring and fall. This really hurt Shaughnessy as he had an open passing system, which was good for a team like Chicago, which was less talented, but it also took some time for them to learn it, and the spring was helpful for that. So Shaughnessy, already starting with a lot of handicaps, would come into Chicago seeing that he would have one talented person at least, and his name was Jay Berwanger. Berwanger came to the school only because Amos Alonzo Stagg would be there, and the first time he would play would be in 1933. Unfortunately, Stagg was gone already. But fortunately for the school, he was the only talented player on this team, which went winless in the Big Ten in 1933, going 0-3-2. Two. And they only scored one touchdown in the Big Ten, and their final record was 3-3-2. Three, three, Burwanger, though, would shine in the Dartmouth game, as he had a huge 65-yard touchdown run and scored a couple of times as well. Moving on to 1934, they would start their season 4-0 behind Burwanger, as he had a 57-yard touchdown run and a 27-0 shutout win over Michigan. Plus, Burwanger also had a 97-yard touchdown run and a 21-0 win over Indiana. So Chicago was starting really well with Burwanger, and even with Burwanger playing on defense, he played linebacker, they would lose their last four games, all versus the Big Ten, including getting shut out versus Ohio State and Illinois to end their season 4-4. Four and four. That would lead to 1935, and it would be Burwanger's last season, and he would shine, having 477 rushing yards, as well as passing for over 900 yards. He would also, of course, win the first ever Downtown Athletic Club's MVP trophy, which is now called the Heisman Trophy. Chicago, though, would go 4-4 four four again and 2-3 and three in the Big Ten, so they couldn't even win a Big Ten title for the amazing season that Burwanger had. Unfortunately for Chicago, they couldn't keep Burwanger, and it only got worse for the school and for Shaughnessy, because Shaughnessy couldn't recruit, as the school just didn't do that. And it would also be stated by the athletic director, T. Nelson Metcalf, publicly. If you think maybe they could go out and get transfers, well, that was also hard too, because of the academic schedule at Chicago, like I mentioned earlier, and the changing of the examination schedule. Due to these restrictions, Shaughnessy seriously considered an offer from Harvard to become their head football coach after the 1935 season. But due to Harvard not offering Shaughnessy faculty status, he declined the job and would stay at Chicago, and it would be something he would regret due to Jay Burwanger not coming back and them not being able to recruit top talent to compete with other teams in the Big Ten, and it would show in the ensuing years. 1936 was probably the best it was going to get, though, because they went 2-5-1 and one with one win in the Big Ten. It was over Wisconsin, which was pretty big, and any conference win at this point should be considered a great thing. Now, I say any conference win should be considered a great thing because in 1937, they didn't win a Big Ten game, and they got shut out in three of them to finish 1-7. and seven. Well, if you thought 1937 was bad, these next two seasons would be basically the kiss of death to this program. In 1938, they started with a 0-0 tie versus Bradley, which really isn't starting out all that good, following it up with three straight Big Ten losses, including two 30-plus point losses to Michigan and Ohio State. They finally got a win, but it was over DePaul University. But again, take any win you can get at this point. The next games were the most interesting as they would first travel to Boston to play Harvard, and Shaughnessy got to see what he could have coached as the Crimson destroyed Chicago. 47 to 13, but the next game was the ultimate embarrassment, as they would play the man himself, Amos Alonzo Stagg, in the College of Pacific. Now, Stagg wouldn't actually be playing, but at 76, he coached Pacific to a 32 to nothing win over Chicago. Chicago got shut out in their finale as well to Illinois, but that Pacific loss was really bad. The 1939 season would bring a big change in the world and to the Chicago football team, which got even worse this season, and it would be called their worst season ever. They won two games this season, but it was over Oberlin and Wabash, who were considered lower level to Big Ten teams. In the remaining six games, Chicago would lose them all and not score a single point. They played three Big Ten teams, and I'll explain why in a second, but it was probably good because they lost to Michigan 85 to nothing. They gave up four total touchdowns to the next year's Heisman winner, Tom Harmon, in this game too. 
They would follow that up with a 61 to nothing loss to Ohio State, and then they finally lost to Illinois, 46 to nothing. Okay, so the reason for the diminished Big Ten schedule was because Chicago's president, Hutchins, hated football. He didn't like that it interrupted two semesters and that it was really dangerous. He never wanted Chicago in a bowl game or to play too many Big Ten games because those Big Ten games usually were the most dangerous games. Hutchins would even come out after the 1939 season to say this was it. Chicago Maroons football is canceled. They wouldn't be leaving the Big Ten though. They didn't do that for about another decade or so in other sports, but they weren't playing football anymore. Hutchins thought that if he discontinued football at a prestigious school like Chicago, other schools would follow. Hutchins wasn't right though about it, as schools would continue to play, and President Robert Hutchins left Chicago in 1951, making the school into a highly academic school like they are today. After Hutchins left, they would hire a new athletic director in 1956. His name was Walter Hess. Hess coached at several schools, and after getting administration approval, he would bring back football at a club level, becoming their coach in 1963 and coaching for about the next decade. They would play Division III football starting in the 1970s and won several conference titles in the University Athletic Association, which are highly selective schools that don't accept postseason invites, so they still have never been to a bowl game or even a playoff game even though they were in kind of the first one over a hundred years ago. In total, Chicago played 467 games from 1892 until 1939 with 287 wins. They played their final 47 seasons at Stag Field, or Marshall Field as it was originally called. Stag Field would be the only thing left of the football team, but it was well known for something else a few years later. On December 2nd, 1942, Enrico Fermi initiated the first nuclear chain reaction under the stands at Stagg Stadium. It was the world's first, but it didn't help the stadium stay for long, as it would be demolished in 1957 to make room for a new library. The school would eventually build a new Stagg Field, which only sits 1,650 people, and it wasn't located on campus, but at least they still play, unlike the school I went over in episode 1. But anyway, I hope you liked this video. If you did, make sure you give me a thumbs up. Also, make sure you leave me a comment below. Tell me what other schools you want me to cover. Make sure you share this video. And of course, make sure you subscribe to the channel, please. And also ring the bell as well so you can get updates on when my next videos will be dropping. And as always, make sure you follow me on Twitter at SportsWronged. And have a great day.